Welcome back, everyone. This week, it's Onderond, Pierre Onderond, and Onderond Investments versus the comment sections of varying sites and social spaces. It's been passed around in the news a lot that hedge fund Onderond loses $1 billion, majority of fund lost. Before we continue any farther, I should make the disclaimer that I believe I'm sick, or at least my throat's pretty well messed up. So if you wonder why I sound different or why my speech patterns are different or my attitude's different or any other thing might be different, that's why. So without the way, let's continue. And if you hear any unprofessional sippings of water, then I apologize. So what have I said time and time again about these types of sensationalism titles? Numerators without denominators. And then why are they using the qualifying words that they're using? Onderon Capital is down 50.8%. So yes, it is technically the majority of the fund. Which is to say that a $2 billion fund turned into a $1 billion fund in the last six months. But hold up. Now what are you going to think? Oh wow, this guy's an idiot. What a fool. What a moron. What kind of idiocy did he engage in with the S&P up 16% and the NASDAQ up, oh, I don't know, 30% or something? Well, let's do the math. He's still up 215%. Since 2019, this chart is brought to you by the article. So he, if, if you invested at the beginning of 2019, you would turn $100 into $315. You would turn $100,000 into $315,000. You would turn $100 million into $315 million. Even with the negative 50.8% drawdown in 2023. Now, if I had to guess, I'm sure they strong, saw a lot of strong inflows in the first half of 2021. Why? Because in 2020, he has a 154% performance in return, which will get a lot of people excited. That will make him see more money, just like ARK Investments, just like a lot of funds. A big year, a lot of people want to flow in money. A big down year, a lot of money flows out. That's how fools operate, and that's how chasers chase, and they play stupid games, and they get stupid rewards. And it's the fund manager and chief investment officer who try to moderate that, just like banks get a lot of cash. It's their choice and their responsibility to do with it reasonable, sensible things to the best of their ability which is why you saw some of the chaos in the banking sector in recent times. Now, you might say, okay, fine. But those who invested at the beginning of 2021 must be down, right? And the answer is no. They're, like, they're actually still up. And they're up 46%. And the S&P is roughly up 16% since the beginning of 2021. Which is to say that Onderond is actually quite nicely outperforming the S&P. 46% versus 16%. See, each $100 invested at the beginning of 2021, by the end of 22, would have been a 541% return. Okay, wow, that's amazing. And it is. But then by this point in 2023, after losing 50%, being down 50%, they're still up 215%. So they went from being up 541% to being up 215%. So then you might want to ask the question, are they down 50% or are they up 200%? roughly speaking. And that's actually a serious question because if you plan on having outsized returns in the stock market, you're going to suffer through some serious drawdowns. Maybe not 50%, but at some point, if you're doing things right, you're going to suffer a 20 or 30% drawdown every possibly, I don't know, one to three years. 
And as Charlie Munger and Buffett talk about how they've suffered through a few 50% drawdowns in their Berkshire Hathaway holdings. Now, I'm actually working on a piece about hedging and my disdain for it in general, not because of the idea of hedging is a bad idea, but when applied to humans' fallibilities and follies and foils and such, it doesn't generally work out well for a whole slew of reasons. So, just for argument's sake, you're going to have to suffer drawdowns. And it's people's inability to handle drawdowns is why they cap their upside performance. And it's also why money managers and hedge funds underperform to some extent. Because we talk about this a lot. And we'll talk about it a little bit more here in a moment. He even notes in the Onderon Capital absolute returns and hedging dampens overall returns. He's making a leveraged directional bet with massive payouts and violent volatility. You can't have up 100% days. I mean, I mean, month, oh, years. <laughs> we'll get there eventually. You can't have these massive outperforming years and be so stupid to think that you're not going to have a massive down year. But the whole point, and by the way, the year's halfway over. Now, of course, everybody's calling for recession, second half of 23, this and that. Therefore, he'll, he'll only perform worse. And that's possibly true. He might be down 70% by the end of the year, 80%. Who knows? I, I don't know. Or oil could go ripping. And even though it's a less lesser likely probability, you could say oil could go to 100 and he'd make it all back. I believe in... He's had years where he was up, say, 100%, and then ended the year up 50%. So why can't you have a year where you're down 50% halfway through, and then at some point you break even, or even up? Which we'll get to on that topic in regards to my own portfolio at the end of this slide deck. And allegedly... Since I don't have access to it, the Commodities Discretionary Enhanced Fund, which is the fund we're talking about in relation to this down 50.8%, has no set risk limit. And that matters. What, what really drew my attention to this story wasn't Onderon himself or his fund. I, I've heard about him. I remember hearing about him in January or February when his fund was down, say, like 20% or something. I was like, okay, whatever. But then I saw multiple comments on the interwebs about j just people being snide, cynical, sarcastic, shitposting, saying ignorant things. So, so here we go. And, and by the way, let me tell you why this is a bad idea, people. Let me tell you why this is a bad idea. Because as far as I'm concerned, I'm running my own money, okay? I'm essentially a hedge fund. And I'm essentially the investor, the sole investor and limited partner in the hedge fund. That's how I think about this. I'm both the sole investor and the chief investment officer. Okay, and so are you, and so is anyone else running their own money. Now, anybody who understands running money understands a lot of the limitations that investors put on you. They don't want to give you money when you need it because they're scared, because the fund's down and the market's down and the stocks are down and they're like, oh my gosh, you're going to buy more of that because their instincts tell them to sell when things are down and to buy when things are up, which is why most people lose money. And the whole reason they gave you money is because you're smart enough to not do that. But here they are scared to give you money. And that's just one of many reasons. So you really shouldn't criticize and condemn your own ideal because that's a very canish thing to do in regards to Cain and Abel. You criticize and condemn and destroy your own ideal, which leaves you nothing. It leaves you destitute. Maybe one day you will successfully be investing $42 a week, and then you'll be able to buy a house with the money in years' time. And then everybody's going to say to you what you say to the other richer people, because richness is all about perspective. Oh, you know, dishonest, bad things they did in the markets, and the stock market's rigged anyway, and blah, 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 blah. So, YOLO with no risk management. 
Don't know how you know that, but okay. Collect 20% performance fees. Should he not? Repeat steps one th plus two every one, two years. Eventually blow up. Retain all previous performance fees. Well, performance fees are, are set on the year. Just imagine you're running your own money, and at the end of the year, you take some money out of that fund to go buy yourself a nice relaxing trip for holiday. Call that your performance fee for managing your book, putting in all the work, and so on and so forth. And assume you're actually up on the year. Okay, are, are you not allowed to do that? Should you not do that? I mean, let's be serious about this. Eventually blow up? Yet again, I just showed you his investors who were with him in 2019 are up 215%. He's not blown up. Collect 20% performance fees. What's wrong with that? Notice how people are result-oriented instead of decision process-oriented. It was okay to collect 20% performance fees for all those other years. Well, except the one, I guess, when he was down 15% in 2019. But those other years, it was okay to collect performance fees. And this year, it's not. Is he still not performing? He's performing to the downside. You can definitely say that, but... Is he still not putting in the work? And, and I'm not sure how his performance fee structure is oriented or anything like that. And then YOLO with no risk management? That's oversimplifying and casually critiquing what he's doing. I'm not sure what risk management he does or doesn't have in place, but I suspect it's less than most. That's how he's able to garner these kinds of returns. 154%? That doesn't mean he's not making risk or, or, or isn't managing risk. But what one, peop what one set of people call risk, i.e. volatility, if, if you want to dampen volatility, then you're going to dampen your returns. And as I pointed out in his own page, it says absolute returns. It's focused on absolute returns. Then we have all these snide, cynical, sarcastic comments, which are really just personally incredulous admittance of one's own ignorance and understanding and contextualization and nuance. So here's this individual saying, no way, really? Thought he was still up 70% from inception. And then the comment is, he's still up since 2019 materially, but that's just an unacceptable drawdown, LOL. Now, I don't know this person. He could be this, uh, these people talking on here. I don't know who they are. What's What's an acceptable drawdown? Because I'm saying this from you, the viewer. I'm, I'm not criticizing these people. To them and him, it could be an acceptable drawdown. So you have to ask, what's your time horizon? What's your time scale? How much do you allow yourself to lose? If you're playing an offshore oil realm, what are you going to do when a recession comes and the stocks drop by 50%? The, then what? Is your entire portfolio in in those thoughts, I mean, I don't know. These are things you need to be asking yourself. This is to be generating thought and concern and insight and introspection and self-actualization. It's an unacceptable drawdown. What is an acceptable drawdown? You need to be able to answer that question for yourself. So you see that down 50%? Wow, that guy's a loser. Unacceptable. Why? Because 50% drawdown is unacceptable. Okay, so then the logical extension continues. And then the next question should be... So at that point, you have to, as I insist, you have to question the concepts in a statement as much as the statement itself. So what is an acceptable drawdown? And look, I get it. 50% is a lot of percents. <laughs> you know, I get it. Now, I, I like this actual, this other person. Well, as long as he's up, I guess it's fine then. It's only unacceptable to zero out your fund, in my opinion. What did he do this time? I actually think trading natural gas is more hazardous than trading dog shit coins. Now, this person's actually offering a, a fair, balanced view. So he hasn't zeroed it out. Now, he might. I don't know. And now here's another snide, cynical, sarcastic comment of a adolescent social skill set and unsophisticated immature mind hedge funds come come the high fees stay for the poor performance is being up 215 percent in what 19 20 21 22 
So four and a half years is, is being up 215% poor performance. And what's with this high fees? What do you mean by high? Why is it high? And is he going FTX way? You know, that irritates me as much as when someone trying to pump some company says, this is the next Amazon. Amazon on what level of analysis? Amazon how? Specifically how Amazon? Now, this is a comment that falls under the category of snide, cynical, sarcastic, but has some truth. Not to say that none of these don't have truth, which is why people feel okay saying them. Start new fund, get... Oh, start new fund, new high water mark. This is a real phenomenon that people should be cognizant of, which is, at some point, you get a large enough drawdown in your fund, and then you have some sort of a clawback or, or performance fee inhibitor that says that until you get back to the high water mark, you don't take performance fees or something like that. So if they get a massive drawdown, knowing that it might take years to get back to the high water mark, they'll just shut the fund down because they're not going to operate that fund for years without any performance fees. That's how they make their money, the individual, the investor. Then we have another comment, hard to see. He was an experienced trader, but still he lost his discipline. What a precautionary tale for the rest of us. What? He, what, what do you mean was experienced? Like he still exists and he's still experienced. So I don't know what that means. And then he lost his discipline. Anytime. Like it's always when you're doing great and you're high on the mountain, everyone loves you. And then once you get beaten up some, everybody bets against you and hates you and doesn't know you and recognize you and pretend, you know, maybe they've moved on because they're sycophants chasing the, the most recent headline of the new superstar rising up. He lost his discipline. Did he? Did he lose his discipline? Like, first of all, maybe he made a probabilistic bet that nine out of 10 times would have manifested. And then this one out of 10 times, he got it wrong. Well, that seems like a disciplined bet. That's just statistics and probabilistic outcomes. Also, like I said, he's still up 215% since 2019. Then we got this comment. But, 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 have you seen how many master's degrees he has on LinkedIn? Pierre Andouin is actually quite an alpha male, you know, whatever cliche colloquialisms you want to use, an alpha male, high performer, type A personality. I mean, the, the guy's like, I think he's like a screenwriter. He was a, a really good swimmer, I think it was, um, active. He's had successful funds, including the one currently. And, um, the, and, and he has multiple degrees. He's a very smart, successful individual. And then we have, yeah, he's still rich. It's all good. Like, okay. Like what does, what does any of this have to do with the, and then you can say, well, what kind of directional, what kind of bets he, he probably, I mean, I'm just pulling this out of thin air, but I'm guessing some kind of oil futures contracts is what he's playing with. And if you haven't noticed, the, the oil market's not doing the best this year. That's my guess. And since it's a leverage bet, it disproportionately affects you, well, to both sides, up or down. So I'm guessing that's why he's down 50%. Then we have this comment. Many were so sure oil prices would keep soaring in 2023, 2022 and 2023, but if they looked at the supply demand plus prisoners the dilemma of OPEC plus they'd have realized they were big oil headwinds very speculative bet ouch now Adim Tumurkan I'm guessing I think is how you pronounce it I would actually recommend you go uh, uh, go subscribe to his Twitter page and he also has a website called Speculator Anonymous which has a fantastic 
reading list on it. Absolutely fantastic. And he writes a lot of articles, which are quite good articles. And he also has a paid tier with trading ideas. And I mean, I recommend you follow this individual. So just because I, so you shouldn't get it twisted. Just because I disagree with someone doesn't mean I don't like them and don't have a net positive respect and admiration for them. So don't get that twisted either. So then we have this comment. Hard to believe someone managing billions is not doing basic economic homework. Look, what an absurd comment to make. Isn't doing basic economic homework? I mean, do you really think he's not doing basic economic homework? Or like I said, 9 out of 10 times he would have got a call correctly. I don't know. Maybe it's 7 out of 10 times. If you can, maybe it's six out of ten times he would have got whatever his framework is. I don't know what Pierre's framework is, but maybe he would got right six out of ten times. So you should bet on that every time, because you'd get it right six out of ten times. Now, how much you bet, how hard you bet, those are different things. Those are portfolio positioning things. I don't know. Maybe he's managed things well enough, actually. And if he hadn't, he'd be down eighty percent. Or maybe if he was more cautionary longer dated futures or something, he'd be down 35%. I don't know. And these people don't know. Now, so I did some research, or basic research, on Andron and came across some YouTube videos. And this is a comment I found on one of the videos. Because this video detailed... His coming up through Vital and trading and making money and the funds that Andurant, Pierre Andurant's had and so on and so forth. I mean, he's kind of a tracking his, his coming up through the industry. And one of the comments was, very privileged, opened a fund, lost one third of it, so just closed it down and opened something else. Now... This is, this is the kind of speech patterns of an unintelligent, unthoughtful person. They're sincere in their ignorance and personal incredulity. But they don't really seemly, seemingly care to reflect reality. And the problem is, is that math is sometimes required to accurately gauge reality. And then people, they're just done. So let's do the math for this, this person. The fun he's talking about is blue gold. And the reason that people are cynical and paranoid about such things is because it happens. Many, many, many a times, somebody will open a fund during some hype phase of a market, collect a bunch of assets under management, write it up, take performance fees, and then when the market turns, the fund goes to shit, people redeem, so on and so forth. They play the game. And they play the game because people let them play the game. The, the investors do it. There's reasons why I don't run money for people. And we'll get into that in a moment. So the fund he's talking about here, about losing one third of it, is blue gold. Pierre Onderon has a fund with someone else called blue gold. That I believe he started in 2008. Okay. 2008. It was up 209%. 2009, it was up 55%. In 2010, it was up 13%. In 2011, it was down 35%. In four years' time, he would have turned $100 into $351 after the 35% drawdown. Okay? That means in four years' time, because this is compounded annual growth rate. If, if you just go into your calculator and type in 209 plus 55 plus 13 minus you know, 35, or, or, like, that's not how math works. You would be up 251% in four years. That's pretty damn good, actually. And, like I've noted and will continue to note, 
for the foreseeable future, you should be expecting a down 35% possible month. At some point, you will be playing something. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be offshore oil. It could be uranium. It could be AI. It could be any subsector, sector, industry, or market as a whole. At some point, you're going to get smashed. Things can be running hot, 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 hot. In a, a uranium video I, I posted a few months ago, I talked about how how people talk about, you know, had you bought this stock at this point and then sold it here at the top at this point, you would have made a thousand percent. And then I noted, well, you actually would have had like a 700% run up, assuming you didn't sell into that run up. And this is over years times, or at least quarters, or at least months, which is long periods of time when you see your stock going up 10% every day. But then, in order to get that last 300% move from 700% to 1,000%, you had to sit through a 40 or 35 or 45% drawdown that lasted a few months before you finally made that last 300%. Okay, it doesn't matter what it is. Elf Beauty Brands, Monster Beverages, th these companies have had amazing performances throughout the history of being publicly traded companies. And guess what? If you wanted to play that out, you were going to have to sit through some nasty drawdowns. So negative 35% isn't out of the question. You should, I don't, in some sense, of course you don't want to welcome that, but you, you recognize that's a byproduct of generating alpha. So yeah, this snide, cynical, sarcastic, ignorant comment doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, you know, too bad for you if you invested in 2010, okay? Too bad for you because you lost money. So let's expand this a little bit. So Onderon is doing commodities, large part oil. So some things we can learn from this is how you express a theme is absolutely crucial. And recognize, too, that when you have billions of dollars of assets under management, for you to buy non-controlling stakes, so 5% of a company, 10% of a company, in, say, $2 billion market cap companies, doesn't put a dent in your performance. Because... Let's say Tidewater is it's over $2 billion, but let's just say, go back a few months, $2 billion market cap. You want a non-controlling interest. You don't want that extra paperwork and the headache and blah, blah, blah. So you buy 5% stake in it. That's, that's, 100, that's $100 million. The most you can buy is $100 million. Okay, if you have a billion dollar fund, that's 10%. If you have a $2 billion fund, that's 5%. So if you're trying to make a big outsized bet on something, you're either going to have to buy a basket of these names, and, th and then you have, to some extent, consolidation risk, liquidity risk, and Diamond Offshore, I think, is $1.4 billion, roughly. So a 5% stake in that, I mean, it doesn't put a dent. Now, this is one or two billion. Just imagine if you have a $10 billion fund or some Ray Dalio $100 billion fund. So therefore, that, that forces you to either play in larger, more liquid names. Think Chevron, Total, um, Exxon, BP, things like that, in which you're not going to get as much alpha and beta out of it, however you want to use that terminology. Because, you know, Tidewater might go up 100%, but in that same time, Exxon, Chevron, you know, think just the XLE basket, might go up 20% or 30%. So either you now buy those names with leverage, or you go out into the futures market and buy commodities. And, and that's what the Onderon Capital, my impression of it is. Future markets are liquid, ample leverage. Okay. So either you curtail and cap your upside return, or you take more risk. And I would say historically he's done quite well, even with a down 35% year 
in the blue gold fund or the down 50% fund. To, to me, I would say that when Onderon opens a new fund, you want to be in the inception of that fund and you'll probably do well. That's another thing. Now, you should also be asking yourself that with such outperformance, you, the investor, should be asking, is this outperformance sustainable? What kind of risk and volatility is being taken on? And can I, as the investor, withstand it? Like, you, you need to ask, how is he outperforming so drastically? What happens if a lull occurs in the market or worse, a sizable pullback? How will he do? Because all the market needs to do is go sideways, not even go down. And when those futures expire, options, whatever you're using, expire, then you lose your initial investment. So you don't even need a big pullback. And by the way, you should be asking yourself these questions in your own book. If you're up 100% on the year, you need to ask yourself, what is going to happen to my portfolio when the market goes down 15% or 20% or 30%? You know what? You need to ask yourself because... Are you taking on that kind of risk and volatility that you can handle and stomach? The reason this is, is because there are some games that are iterable and some that aren't, such as Russian Roulette. You get in when the water's warm, knowing one day there'll be a massive freeze. Then you close down shop and move to St. Bart's, or you start a new fund since you're penalized and deprived of performance fees until you reach your high water mark. That is reality, but not all of reality. He didn't leave his initial investors bag holding. And those who chased played stupid games and they got stupid results, in part. Even though later year investors in, that, in, in the Onderon fund are actually still in the money. Because this is what happens. Some people say, wow, there's a hype around tech. Think dot com. Think the last few years of certain funds. I won't, I won't name drop any that said, oh, okay, everybody's excited about tech. Let's buy a bunch of tech. And then they run up and they corner the market. And all these funds uh, corner the market and just run up the prices. And then their performance is doing well. So then more money flows in. Well, now they're not going to be, get, they're not going to be able to get out. But someone's going to get margin called. Something's going to happen at some point, And someone's going to lose their ass. And... So they lose their ass, they're down 50% in a year, and they say, screw this. They, they have a high watermark, they, they know they're not going to get it back for years. And they know that they're not going to get it back for years because the bubble burst. When, when easy money was flowing and investors were stupid and throwing money around, those, those were the good times and they just rode, rode the ride. So they take their money, their performance fees, and then they go retired in St. Bart's. That's a very real thing. But that's not all of reality. There are other fund managers who are genuine and sincere. And the problem is you, can, you, you, you act like a, a bigot and an ideologue and you condemn and criticize every, all, the, all the fund managers and say some fund managers are bad, therefore all fund managers are bad. And the answer is, no, you're just stupid. And if all fund managers are mad or bad, and you're your own fund manager of sorts, not technically or speaking, legally speaking, but for all intents and purposes you are, so are you bad now? It's, it's an absurd statement. And it also forces you to never be able to invest in genuine, sincere, top-notch performers because you've condemned the entire category of fund managers. There are fund managers, yet again, I'm not going to say any names, that, that are top-notch performers. And they're sincere and they're genuine, and th you're going to suffer volatility investing with them, whether that's on a monthly basis, a, a quarterly basis, or a yearly basis. It's going to happen. And either, either buckle up, butter, buttercup, or get out. Because the last thing they need you doing is redeeming your money at the bottom of one of those volatile periods instead of giving them more money to invest. Which brings me to the next point. The math is a bit tricky too. Say you have a $100 million fund. You lose 50% of it in a year. You're now down to $50 million. Well, at that point, half your limited partners are going to redeem if they haven't already. 
Now you're down to a $25 million fund. Had no one redeemed, you'd need to make 100% return to get back to break even. Now at $25 million, you'll need to make 400%. And you know what? I'd shut my doors too. I definitely would. And this is one reason why I don't run money for people. Unless you can find a niche group of people to invest with you who understand what it takes for absolute outsized gains, then it's an uphill battle. You could be up 100% on the year and then have a 35% drawdown and all your LPs will complain to you about how you lost them all sorts of money. But you're still up 30% on the year even after the 35% drawdown. Like, what are you complaining about? The thing is, people don't math well. As you've seen by these comment sections, they nor their money are loyal, which creates all sorts of perverse incentives that I talk about on this channel. If the limited partners weren't such fools, perhaps the fund managers wouldn't act so ridiculous. But now that just somehow makes me an apologist and victim shamer which is anything but the truth. Now, let's break this down briefly. What kind of perverse incentives do stupid limited partners make? Well, let's say it's May, or let's say it's June, somewhere in there. You know that if your second quarter reports to your investors are not good, that they're going to redeem you. So what do you have to lose? So you go out in the markets and you buy just the purest of crap companies because they have the highest leverage bet. Now you try to be intelligent to your best to the best of your ability, but you're gambling with their money because what's the worst that can happen? They're redeem. They're going to redeem anyway if you don't claw back some gains. So upside reward is they don't redeem. Downside reward is you lose more of their money and they redeem anyway because they're going to redeem, okay? If you do not have a bang out June month, they're going to redeem. So you take their money and you gamble with it. Why wouldn't you? Now, if you had investors with a little bit more equanimity equanimity and, and uh, quiescence, and understood context and nuance better, you could sit them down and explain to them, yeah, we're going to have drawdowns. That's part of investing. The market just doesn't go up and to the right. What would you expect? And they'll be like, well, you should be hedged. It's like, why would I put on hedges? I'd rather have a, as, as Buffett put it, he, he'd rather have a bumpy 15 than a smooth 12. But the fact of the matter is, most investors, instead of having a bumpy 15, rather have like a smooth 5. They'd rather you just underperform the benchmark every year than outperform it and it be bumpy. Like, it's a real pain in the ass for a lot of these hedge fund managers. You're, I mean, you're really just babysitting a lot. And, and that, by the way, is no different than the average investor. They're babysitting themselves with their emotions. You know, they, they go out, try to make some money in the markets, and their emotions are just constantly pestering them, and, and they're... Their myopia is pestering them and their immediate gratification and their impulses are just attacking them. And, and here they are trying to be the logical, rational investor. And and people, you know, they have a poor integration of these sub-personalities. Think of each emotion, fear, greed, as sub-personalities. And those sub-personalities are your limited partners, your investors. So you have greed over here and you have fear over here and, and they're both yapping in your ear while you're just trying to execute trades and be intelligent and rational about the whole thing. It's, it's a real pain and it's no wonder why most people fail. So a few examples of what I was talking about. Tidewater, it's a $2.82 billion company, up 61% on the year as of Friday's close. Valeris, $4.73 billion company, down 1.59% as of the June 30th close. And then you have Diamond Offshore Drilling, because I just threw that in there for some reason I left out Transocean. $1.44 billion. It's up 49% on the year. Now, let's look at these charts. As, as I've bemoaned to some extent in past videos, 
These names have gone nowhere pretty much all year. Just look at Diamond Offshore. From January to February, shot up. Rocket ship emoji. To the moon. And then from February to pretty much June 30th, <laughs> it went nowhere. And it could very easily retrace and retouch it. Maybe maybe it's a breakout. We'll see. I don't know. Let's go. Uh, let's, let's look at Tidewater. Same phenomenon. Ran hard in January. Same thing with Transocean. Ran hard. And then pretty much been sideways. Up and down. Volatile as hell. I've lost uh, 20%. Let, let's put this in perspective, okay? On Tidewater. I bought my initial share. I, I bought a second share a couple weeks ago. But my initial share I bought exactly at $40. It then went up and touched $45. And then pulled back to $40. Or, or in that range, I, I lost. I don't think, I don't think I have the chart here. I don't. I think I lost fifteen percent on tide water. Or no, I think I think I lost. I think I lost like twenty percent on tide water. Then another time I lost fifteen percent on tide water. Then another time I lost twelve percent on tide water. Depending on the week, depending on the month after I made my initial position. So, but each and every one of those times, I was actually still up on tide water. Tidewater went from $40 to $50. And then it pulled back to $43. So then you ask... I'm not, I'm not going to do the percentage. But I'm still up on Tidewater. Now you could say I'm down on Tidewater. Am I down $7 on Tidewater or am I up $3 on Tidewater? Especially over such a short time duration. It's it's absurd to even think that way. Especially on a, on a secular trending theme that's going to last quarters if not years. It does get frustrating to see something track sideways for five months, though, that you, you're in. But it offers buying opportunities if you so wish to, to do so. Anyway, XLE, down 3.72%. Now, here's a, another interesting thing. So here's the S&P. This is back to the Onderon Capital. From the beginning of January 2019 to yesterday the S&P is up 75%. Okay? Now what did we say earlier about Onderon Capital since 2019? Up 215%. So if you invested in the S&P in 2019, now it's it's a so far proposition. How are you doing? Well, so far. How's your investments going? Well, so far. How many people bought Ken Ross Gold at $3, wrote it up to $20, never sold? But at $20, I could say, how are you doing? And then you're saying, I'm doing phenomenal in my Ken Ross Gold position. Like, awesome. You go talk to them a couple of years, say, how'd you do or how are you doing on Ken Ross Gold? Well, it's back down to $3. Not good at all. You see what I mean? So, so Onderon Capital in two years could close its doors or in two years could be up 200%. I don't know. And I don't know to the extent that I wouldn't make a, a dollar a bet on it. Then you have what could be considered a reasonable benchmark, which is the XLE. From the beginning of January of 2019 to yesterday, the XLE is up 35%. Wow. Am I right? Absolute wow. So 215% versus 35%. Do you not think you're going to have a bad year, a bad month, a bad quarter, or a bad two quarters? And then again, the year's only halfway over. All right. That's all I have to say on that. Let me get a sip of water. My voice is holding up much better than I thought it would. We're going to get into the couple of interesting things. We'll see how long this goes. This is how I feel about Valeris. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you've seen these charts, but they're funny. But when I saw this, I was like, man, that, even though I'm not really down on Valeris, I'm not now, but I've never been, I'm decent at buying dips and stuff. So knowing when to buy. So I've never been down 
too much on Valerius, but I still feel about this with Valerius because as we saw in the chart, even though it's what only down a couple of percent on the year from its all time high, it's actually down, I, I want to say like 25%. So here's my portfolio. <laughs> this last week was absolutely amazing. And not really so much the last week, Friday. Phenomenal. Now, with that said, you don't want to get too excited about these things. You don't want to get emotional. But if you get emotional when things go up, that means you're probably going to act emotional when things go down. So you, you have to keep your emotions in check. What happened Friday, what happened in the last week of June, what happened in June altogether? Phenomenal. Well, pretty good month. Let's put it that way. And Friday was absolutely ridiculous. Tidewater was up 10%. Uh, Valerius was up 5 or 6%. Transocean was up 9%. Louisiana Pacific has just rocketed over the last week. And uranium is giving back some. But everything's in the green. You don't see everything in the green too often, seemingly, in my charts so far this year. KRE, up 10%. IET, so my, my bank stocks, we'll just call it split the difference. We'll just 10% is up on that. Ken Ross Gold beating around. You know, I don't know. I've, I've kind of drawn this line on the charts in which I, I would want to sell it so that way I don't it doesn't become a negative position because initially I bought it. I bought Ken Ross Gold before the whole banking thing happened. I did not buy it at all because of that. And then it ran up. I, was, I think I was up. And then I chased, which, you know, <clears throat> that's what you get for chasing. Play a stupid game, get stupid prizes. I was up, I think, like 25%, 20-25% on it, and that was after chasing. My initial position, I'd been up like like 40%, maybe, And but I chased it. I, I was trying to get some size into the position because I was just going to kind of you know, buy it as, it as it chopped along. I actually very well might buy some, I don't know, we'll see. But some of these, these names, I'm a pretty small channel, so... I think I, I can get away with saying it, but if, if you go look at Pan American Silver or Hecla Mining or uh, AG, ticker symbol, I, for, I forgot, Maj First Majestic or or Newmont or Barrett Gold, but mainly the silver ones, like they've given back. Like what happened to the banking crisis, people? What happened to the fear and a panic? Like you know some moron. And, and I, I hope they've learned their lesson. You know somebody somewhere shorted, I don't know, let's just say shorted KRE at the very bottom and went long, I don't know, Kinross or First Majestic or something at the top. And so their KRE position, which is why I don't like these pair trades, completely blew up in their face. And who, who knows, maybe they bought leap calls and puts on it, so maybe they're good. I, I don't know. And, and then they gave back all the gains. Like Ken Ross is holding up, but the silver names, Pan American Silver, I believe, is back to, let's call it March 10th levels. First Majestic is, is below it. And it's, I, I don't know. Part of me wants to sell. Part of me actually wants to buy some, some silver names. I, I almost did it. I almost did it Friday, but I, I couldn't pull the trigger. So I'm going to do some more reading and researching and thinking. Okay, now, this is a point I've made before and I'll make again, which is lumpy gains, okay? Lumpy gains. June 1st, June 2nd, and June 30th were the only days out of the month of June that were, try, try not to cuss, Worth a hoot to my portfolio. And they were phenomenal days. Phenomenal by my standards, which is, I don't know, I'm just arbitrarily making it up. I've talked about it before. June 1st, June 2nd were both above 3% day returns. By the way, keep in mind, 
This is all with me being, well, I, I think now with these big moves, I think I'm now 26% cash. Like, that matters, people. I mean, it matters in tons of ways, but it matters in, in effects. If you can have a 3% update with 25% cash, just imagine the update you would have had fully invested. But the problem is there's, there's reasons why I don't stay fully invested and why you will generally see me with around 25% cash. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if this is a thousand dollar account or a hundred thousand dollar account. There's reasons why you will see me sitting around that and sometimes more. I'm actually building it up or trying to, but if I go buy a couple of names I'm thinking about, that's going to draw down on my cash. And I don't know how I feel about that at the moment, but so June 1st, June 2nd, June 30th, June 30th was another 3% day. It's those three days. June 1st and 2nd were a Thursday, Friday. That's that's sub period. And then you had three or four, four weeks. I think four weeks after that. Okay. This, so the sub period, we'll call that week one of those two days. And week two down, week three down, week, I don't know, week four down. And, and then the last couple of days, outperformance. So you get frustrated, as, as I pointed out to the Tidewater chart or the, the Diamond Offshore chart. These things have been trading sideways, consolidating, distribution. I don't know. I'm not a technical analysis, analyst. The point is, that's how these returns work. I, I pointed out on one of the uranium charts. The uranium price skyrockets 20 or 30%, then it consolidates in some kind of a pennant, triangle, whatever distribution thingy consolidation you want to call it and then it does that for I can't remember the time period now 12 months I think maybe is what it was and then it shoots up 20 or 30 percent and then what you don't want to do is miss the shoot up 20 or 30 percent move because the problem is people chase into that and then they get chewed up in the market for a year so they just dump their positions all, all, all the weak hands all the paper tigers all the laser eyes. They dump their position. They, they get a loss and then they're burnt by the sector and then they don't want to revisit it. And then it's only because they acted stupidly towards the sector that they got burnt by the sector, which then prevents them from ever making money in the sector, which is the offshore example. You know, a cup of coffee, capital, was created at the beginning of 2023. I can assure you that if it was created... At the beginning of 2019, you would have saw me buy offshore names. And you would have saw me get destroyed on those names. And then, in, I'm trying to remember, 2021, post-bankruptcy, when Valerius, what, well, not Tidewater, Tidewater came out in like 2017, and uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here, Diamond, Let's just say Diamond and Valeris. You, you would have saw me invest in them. Because the market was healing. And I would have gotten back. I presume I would have. Maybe I would have been burnt too bad from 2019. I would have invested in those names again. Knowing I was badly burnt. Say you invested $100 in 2019. Lost all $100 in 2019 because they all went bankrupt. Then in 2021 you come back with $100. You'd be up, say, 300% on some of these names. you turn that $100 into $400. So guess what? You would have took your $100, you would have recouped your $100 loss, and then you would have had $200 more. It's an iterative bet. It's an iterative game. And that's how you have to play it. And, and that's that. But just know, this. I, I'm barely... Oh, I have one more slide. I forgot. <clears throat> So this is funny. So we're 26 weeks into the year, which means at $42 a week, because every week deposits $42, that's my cash flow, $42 a week, 26 weeks, it's $1,092. So had you just given me the hundred or the $1,092 at the beginning of the year, I would have, so far this year, I would be up 7.33%, okay? On a time-weighted average rate of return, which is a standard metric and way that 
returns are measured in the hedge fund financial world. Go Google time-weighted average rate of return. If you're depositing money in your accounts and you're just counting that as money, not account, if you're not accounting for that, then you're going to have larger gains than you actually have. Or you will register larger gains than you actually have. So, I don't know, go Google Investopedia time-weighted average rate of return. I've talked too long. My throat's getting tired and that's not what this is about. Then if I was a liar, starting with the initial deposit of $42, you know, January 1st, and not factoring in further cash deposits, I'd be up 2,690% for the year. And the reason I put that in there was because of these YouTubers and, and other people who just lie to themselves and others and don't want to account, keep constant their comparisons, controls for the variables, those type, which is a lot of type, who say, I'm going to grow. That, that's why, the, in part, the channel started, as I've noted, and we'll note again, I imagine, is it's a stock portfolio challenge of, of growing my portfolio and showing how you showing to the average investor with only a few dollars extra a day how, how they can make a difference on their life. And, and the reason I bring this up is because I don't know how many channels I've seen we're growing my portfolio to $100,000 because yet again, as I've criticized enough, people really like to, the big numbers. It gets them excited, all emotional and razzle-dazzled. And they'll, they'll start with $10,000 and grow it to $12,000 and then deposit $5,000 and now they're at $17,000. Then they'll grow it to $21,000 and then they'll deposit $7,000 and now it's... And, and on and on it goes. It's like, hold up. Like, how can you possibly track their performance? And, and, and they really don't. It's just all about making that account a bigger number, not actually demonstrating intelligent performance, not guiding anyone, not showing anyone, not, not being helpful. Actually, I would say it's antithetical to helpful. It, it's, it's something to despise. It's intellectually dishonest and disingenuous and is not fruitful for anyone watching. Unless you just want to, I don't know, vicariously live through someone and pontificate and, and mentally masturbate about, you know, how awesome they are. So I, I don't know. So, so far, I'm up 17.23%. June, you know, June was amazing. So, like I said, the, the first and second, it was like 6% I was up. And then every week after that, I just bled. Now, I've talked about it time and time again. Monday pops, it's dropped by Friday, and then rinse and repeat every week, and, and it's just it's exhausting. If if you let it exhaust you, and it's 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 ir- it's a mild irritation to me. Uh, I've become accustomed to it, desensitized, probably a better word, and that's why equanimity is so important. And and so I was like, oh man, like I was just really concerned about beating the S and P because that's my benchmark. And even though it's a shorter time period and I shouldn't get caught up on the monthly or even quarterly uh, performance, I still do. And kind of keeps me honest and in check and makes me ask myself, why did I under or overperform? And like the first quarter I underperformed by, I don't know, one, I, I, did, I did like six and a half percent, let's call it my first quarter. And then the second quarter is like, the, you know, as of the end of this is like 10, 10 and a half, 10 and a half, 10.44 percent, something like that. So my time weighted average rate of return is 17.23 percent. And the S&P, I'm, I'm, I only say this, but I'm actually surprised. If it wasn't for Friday, this would not be the case, which really shows you how much a difference a day matters. Okay, so back to the, I already forgot, Andwand or Pierre, I remember Pierre. Back to Pierre. Everybody's talking shit on him. Halfway through the year. Okay? The difference that Friday made to my performance for both the month, the quarter, and the year had a massive role. One day. One day. I don't know what that is in percentage term. 26 times 5 is 130 days. So, less than 1% of days changed me from a loser to a winner, let's call it. 
So, so that's really worth thinking about, especially when this man, Pierre, has six months to, to prove himself. And why you should never beat yourself up too much over any given day, whether it's in your favor or not. Oh, I, I, I was going to say the S&P is up. I mean, I'm just, I'm not beating it by much. It's, S&P's up 16 point something percent. But I'm winning, so whatever. Maybe July races all, who knows? You know, that, that's the beauty of it. I have no idea. So we'll see what happens. And uh, this is actually why I didn't want to make, I knew this was going to be a long video. And that's why I didn't want to make it, but I was really afraid my voice was going to give out. But it's actually held up phenomenally well. I've said phenomenal way too many times in this video. I'm, I'm going to chalk that up to the sickness. <laughs> uh, with that said, thank you for watching, as always. And until next time.